Hi, it's January 19th, 2012. I'm Peter Martinson, and this is your weather report. Now, people have been freaking out about the loss of Arctic sea ice over the past few years, but it's reaching fever pitch. Now, everyone's seen the images of the poor polar bears stranded on a floating piece of Arctic sea ice, and you're told that it's this situation because man's heating up the globe and melting all the Arctic ice. In reality, polar bears hunt from floating pieces of sea ice. This polar bear is hunting seals, which is what polar bears eat. Now, there's actually very little known about how ice functions up in the Arctic, because there's almost nobody up there. Since, as I'll show, much of our weather starts in the Arctic, we really do need to move populations up there, and soon, so we can begin to manage it, much like we've managed the water resources down in the lower latitudes over the past several centuries. What we'll also see is that temperature is not the most important thing when it comes to sea ice. But first, let's talk about the weather. Now, it's been really warm this winter in the Northern Hemisphere, both in the United States and in Europe. If you look at uh, just snowfall in the, in the United States, this year it's very low. Now, in this image, red means uh, lower than average snow cover. Blue means higher than average snow cover. So as you can see, it's a very below average year for snow. If you compare this to a year ago, you see that the situation is very different. There's tons of snow on the ground in the United States January of last year. For example, up in the Rockies, uh, way more snow than there usually is up there. And this contributed to the very intense flooding in the Missouri River later on in the summer. Now, the recent heat has a lot to do with what we've talked about before, the polar vortex. Now, the polar vortex is the main jet stream in the northern latitudes. When it's moving very quickly and very strong, it tends to stay very tight uh, against the Arctic Circle. When it slows down and becomes a, a weaker polar vortex, it can send down these big loops, which bring Arctic air down very deep into the lower latitudes, which cause things like Arctic blasts and Arctic storms. Now, since mid-year 2011, the polar vortex has been incredibly strong and powerful and fast, the strongest recorded since 1990. This is represented by this graph, which is a graph of what's called the Arctic Oscillation Index. When the numbers are high, it means that it's a very strong polar vortex, very close to the pole. When it goes down in the negative, that means uh, it becomes weaker, and you start to have these dips of uh, Arctic blasts. Uh, now, Right at the end of December, a wild phenomenon happened, which you can see somewhat represented here by the dip, and then the next dip in the beginning of January. Now watch this animation. You can see this is uh, Asia, United States, North America. What this represents is temperature up in the stratosphere, about 30 to 40 kilometers above the ground. What you're seeing is a rapid warming. It's called a sudden stratospheric warming event. Now, this happens every couple of years, and nobody's sure what causes it. <clears throat> there are some indications that it may have to do with solar activity. Other indications it may have to do with uh, sea temperature in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. But anyhow, this happened. What they tend to coincide with are dramatic slowings, uh, slowing down of the polar vortex, weakening of the polar vortex. So since the beginning of January, the Arctic Oscillation has actually dipped into the negative a few times, which allowed that jet stream to come down into the lower latitudes, and that's what gave us the first taste of real winter. Now to the ice. Scientists from the University of Washington did a study some years ago of the effects of a strong polar vortex on the motions of Arctic sea ice. What they found was that if they watched the motion of scientific buoys which were stuck in the ice, in the years where the vortex was incredibly strong, such as the record-breaking years of 1989 and 1990, much of the ice was swept from the coast of Alaska into a track across the pole past Greenland and into the Atlantic Ocean where it then melted. In fact, they reported that before 1990, a good portion of the Arctic sea ice was over 20 to 30 years old and had just been accumulating year after year. That was the ice that got swept out in the Atlantic in 1990. Today, most of the ice is well under three years old. 
No wonder it's been difficult to get a good freeze up there. A very strong solar maximum occurred in mid-1989, which was concurrent with the strongest polar vortex on record. Recently, several scientists noted that although the number of sunspots and the total solar irradiation probably has very little effect on the Arctic Oscillation and the polar vortex, the dramatic variations in ultraviolet radiation from the sun could be very important. If this is true, then you would expect to see the polar vortex vary in some correspondence with the sunspot cycle. The current solar cycle is a strange one. As you can see in this plot of sunspot number put together by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, it started back in 2010 but didn't really get going until 2011, and then it didn't really get going until mid-2011 when it took off and possibly reached sunspot maximum, which uh, according to the forecast is about a year and a half early. Since then it's died down quite a bit, but in the past couple of days solar activity has picked up again on account of this giant uh, pack of sunspots just rounding the bend now. Back on Monday, January 16th, this pack of spots unleashed a dramatic sequence of flare activity, which included small flares, but also a very long flare, which you can see right there. Here's a close-up in the extreme ultraviolet. Very beautiful, but very violent activity. This activity also unleashed a coronal mass ejection, as you can see here. Here it is again. Part of which may hit the Earth. As you can see in this forecast track developed by the Goddard Space Weather Laboratory, the brunt of it is going to hit Venus, this little green dot. But the edge of it may graze the magnetosphere of the Earth, the yellow dot. Now, if it hits our, magnet our magnetosphere, it could produce a geomagnetic storm, which could possibly affect our upper stratosphere and, in turn, affect the polar vortex. So, if I were a weatherman, I would forecast some cold weather in the next couple of days. Thank you.